Should have asked, is there a pointer here, or do I do it with the mouse? Okay, I'll do it with the mouse. It's, 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 a, it's a great pleasure to come to Saudi Arabia. This is uh, Dr. Sharman, my first visit here, and it's been a delight so far. I wish that we could stay a bit longer and, and see the country. It's also a special delight to come out and see this campus, uh, which uh, has so much promise, I think, uh, in being a real gem of education in all the areas that are going to be here, and especially I'm glad to see if there's a, uh, going to be a strong program in, in oncology and, and immunotherapy as well. So what I would like to do is, is talk to you today about um, a particular kind of immunotherapy called immune checkpoint blockade, which we've been working on since the mid-90s. Uh, I'd like to first talk about where it came from um, and then show you, you know, where we are now and then uh, some examples of work that's been carried on by myself with Dr. Sharma uh, illustrates that how we can uh, get this into many more cancer types and, and hopefully be successful at treating a great number of different types of, of cancer with it. So, whoops. So why immunotherapy to treat cancer? Well, I think everyone knows that cancer is, is caused by mutations, a lot of mutations typically and eventually works, results in high genomic instability. Um, and really, cancer can be looked at as many different kinds of diseases, not just different histotypes, but also each with ge different distinct uh, genetic alterations, which has allowed them in the past to be treated uh, with single, with targeted inhibitors directed towards those driver mutations that cause cancer. One of the problems with that, though, is since there are mutations going on, inevitably when you target one driver mutation, the tumor can escape that. For BRAF inhibitors, for example, the mutation in BRAF, one particular mutation, B600E, is found in almost 60% of melanoma patients. Drugs against it are very successful in about 90% of patients with that mutation and inducing great shrinkage of the tumors. But the problem is the tumors inevitably come back there's, so far, there have been 15 different ways of discovering, of, of, that have been discovered, of mechanisms by which tumors could escape uh, drugs targeting that, that one uh, mutation. Immunotherapy offers several advantages. One is specificity. I think everybody knows that T cells recognize peptides displayed in the surface of cells in the context of MHC antigens, and so which sample basically everything that's going on in a cell. In the case of cancer, it's becoming quite clear that the immune system is preoccupied with peptides derived from those mutations, not, not, uh, the, not just the driver mutations, but the passenger mutations as well. So depending on the mutation load, the immune system has perhaps hundreds of different targets that it can go after in a cell because of the mutations. It's not exclusively the story. I'll show you an example where there are also some tissue-specific type different, tissue specific differentiation antigens that can also be targeted. But the exciting thing about this is that, that the mutations that cause cancer, the whole process, is really the target of immunotherapy. The second thing is memory. Once uh, you've got T cells which can detect these alterations that are associated with cancer cells. You've got them for the rest of your life. And so if the tumor comes back, they can be reactivated to attack the cancer. And of course, with radiation and chemotherapy, once the treatment's gone, it's gone and there's, there's no um, remnant of it. And finally, there's adaptability because the immune system is constantly changing. It's a living thing, constantly sampling what's going on. If new antigens arise, the immune system can form responses to those. And so it's just a long-winded way of saying the immune system is a match for cancer. And while that's been obvious for a long time, uh, it hasn't been really too successful um, a, pro a, a, a way of treating cancer for about 30 years and more people have been trying actively to do this at the clinic, but it has never really worked very well until the last several years. And in fact, led a lot of people to just give up on, on immunotherapy. Um, but I'll just start off and show you this slide, which is one of my favorites. This is perhaps the longest survivor of ipilimumab, which is a drug that we developed against uh, CTLA-4, that I'll be talking about quite a lot. Uh, the panel on the left, uh, this is a woman who lived in Southern California. The panel on the left shows you uh, the lung, the, she had melanoma. There's a lung mass here, a pleural effusion here. She had failed every other therapy 
uh, in, including not just chemotherapies, but high dose IL-2, uh, antigen pulse, dendritic cells, so also a few uh, immunotherapies. Uh, but she progressed through all of them. And at University of California, Los Angeles, her doctor, Tony Rebus, uh, offered her the phase one, in the phase one trial, abipilimumab. So we've got this new drug that's never been in humans before. And would you tra take it? And she said, I'll do anything. I just want to be able to see my son graduate from college in a few months. And at the time, the life expectancy after diagnosis with this disease, the median expectancy was 11 months. So she didn't have a lot to look forward to. Anyway, she got the drug, one injection, three milligrams per, ml, uh, uh, per kilogram of ipilimumab, and about four months later, all her tumors were gone. I visited Tony at UCLA in 2011, 10 years after that, and she'd just come in for a 10th year checkup, and you can see she was still free of tumors 10 years after a single treatment with no additional treatment whatsoever. And uh, that was in 2011, as I said, this is 2018, and she's still doing fine. So she's almost 18 years out after a single thing. Has seen her son not only graduate from high school, but college, and start his own family, and his own kids. Well, where did this come from? Well, it didn't come from sequencing tumors and finding actionable mutations and then testing drugs against it. It came basically from fundamental research into the mechanisms of regulating T cell activation um, and regula regulation of cells as they expand after that. And um, so this led us to develop this technique called immune checkpoint blockade. It's really a paradigm shift in cancer therapy for a couple of reasons. One is it treats cancer not by targeting the tumor cells at all. You don't even think about the tumor cell uh, in, in using this therapy. Um, by first approximation anyway. Uh, and it also doesn't involve turning the immune system on with cytokines or specific vaccines. You don't need to know what the immune system is recognizing. You just need to block inhibitory pathways of T cells so that they could do a better job of what they were doing anyway, and they can eliminate the tumors. So to take you back to the start then, um, T cell activation um, is complicated, but all that complicated. Um, in 1982, when we discovered the structure of the T cell antigen receptor, everybody thought that was the answer to the T cell activation. Just flip that switch and T cells take off. But it quickly became clear that that wasn't the case. By the late 80s, it was known that there was a second signal called a co-stimulatory signal that had to be given, that had to be received by the T cell contemporaneously with the antigen receptor signal in order to get T cells fully activated. And when you got those two signals, when a T cell got those two signals, um, T turned on a program which led to rapid proliferation, differentiation of the cells to affect their function, and the cells go out and, and look for whatever the problem is and deal with it. Uh, that's a very important uh, phase of development of immune response because you've got about 50 million different T cells with different receptors in your body. And uh, I don't think we need it quite that dark. <laughs> People are gonna go to sleep. Uh, in any event, you, got to, you need hundreds of thousands of them to actually deal with a virus infection or to deal with the cancers. So you've got to go from a few dozen to hundreds of thousands in a week or so. And so the T cells take off. They start dividing about every six hours as fast as a bacteria. Um, and, and the point is that at some point you have to stop that. And uh, the people really didn't know how that happened. At first it was thought the T cells just died. Uh, with a fast, fast ligand interaction, a process called activation to do cell death. But what we discovered in uh, the mid-90s was this was actually an active process that the CD28, which we showed was the receptor for that, the CD28 cosimitory signal, uh, this, the results of this T cell receptor plus CD28 was not only all of this stuff, which says go, but also it turns on another program mediated by the uh, induction of activity of the CTLA-4 gene, which is a close homologue of CTLA-4, that's going to stop the immune response. And so with time, CTLA-4 accumulates and it builds up to high levels of a cell. And we think what it does is just bind to the same ligands, B71 molecules, as CD28, outcompetes it, it prevents the cells from receiving co-stimulation, it stops the response. And again, you have to do this because we knock the gene out 
as in a few other labs. And what happens in mice that don't have the CTLA-4 gene is they die at about three weeks of old from a lymphadenopathy. They basically fill up with T cells. Uh, so you, this is a fundamental mechanism that you have to have in order to survive a response, to stop that proliferative phase and protect you. Well, what does this have to do with cancer? Well, we've been doing some work at, uh, about this time showing that if we put the B7 ligands uh, for CD28 into tumor cells, as you can see here, the wild-type tumor cell grows. Uh, there's experimental tumors in mice. But if we put the B7 genes into them, they basically won't grow. They may grow for a little while, but they get rejected. And so this told us that tumors, even though they have antigens, they're full of antigens, they do not stimulate an immune response because they can't provide that second signal to CD28 that you need to initiate the immune response. And so all you need, you know, if you just provide the B7 signal, they get rejected. And so um, we tried to use B7 transduced T cells, uh, tumor cells as a vaccine, which for a number of reasons would, was not successful. But that informed uh, an idea once we figured out what CTLA-4 did. And that is this, that since the tumor cells don't have the co-stimulatory signal, again, they're invisible to the immune system and they get a head start. There may be T cells with specificity for their antigens, but they can't do anything until the tumor reaches such a size as you get necrotic cell death, uh, inflammation, dendritic cells and other antigen presenting cells come in and pick up tumor debris, process it, and display it on the surface of the antigen presenting cell in the context of the B7 molecules. That gives the co-stimulatory signals and the T cells can take off. And so the outcome of that then just depends on how successful the T cells are because the CTLA-4 clock, remember, is started at exactly the same time the T cells start proliferating. And so if that clock stops the T cells before they eliminate all the tumor cells, the tumors win. And, but if the, t tumor, the T cells can reach a number that they eliminate the tumor, of course, the T cells win. So we thought we could solve this problem by just disabling the breaks, putting in an antibody to CTLA-4 that'll prevent it from binding to its ligands and disable the breaks so the T cells will just keep going as long as they need to come on. And so it was a really interesting idea for a couple of reasons. One is that, again, since you're treating the immune system and not the tumor cell, the kind of cancer doesn't make any difference. You know, theoretically, this ought to work at least have the possibility of working against all kinds of cancer. The immune system doesn't know whether cancer is a kidney cancer or breast cancer or anything else. It doesn't know whether it's caused by a RAS mutation or a BRAF mutation or anything. It just knows it has things in it that are foreign, like a, you know, the same way it would see a virus infected cell. Um, and the second thing about it was that while you could take advantage of necrotic cell death and use it as a monotherapy, you could also combine it with other things chemotherapies, radiation, anything basically that kills tumor cells will start this cross priming process and lead to an immune response. But again, that would be terminated unless you do something to take the brakes off. And so again, we that was the idea of checkpoint blockade. At first it was CTLA-4 blockade because it was the only checkpoint not known. So this is our first experiment that shows a tumor injected in mice growing on their backs. If you inject out of CD28, the tumors grow faster, suggesting that there is a nascent immune response, but it just can't get the job done. But when we injected antibodies against CTLA-4, the tumor grows for a while and then gets rejected. And the mice are permanently immune to challenge with that same tumor for the rest of their lives. And, and they leave out, live out a normal lifespan with, at least in mice, absolutely no adverse events. And so we saw this result, I was astounded because we expected to slow the tumor, but in instead we, we cured essentially all the mice. And I'm not gonna show you more work. I mean, we're so astounded by this, we basically dropped everything else we were doing in the lab for a while anyway, and looked at many different kinds of tumors. And sure enough, in mice we found that there was virtually no tumor that we couldn't cure. Um, in, in tumors that were induced by carcinogens, um, and were considered very immunogenic, CTLA-4 antibodies by themselves could do the job. But in spontaneous tumors, such as a tumor called the B16 melanoma, which nobody had ever really been able to get an immune response to, we could add a vaccine of irradiated tumor cells and 
combination with CTLA-4 and cure that. And so this was, at least in the mouse models, essentially um, a universal drug which in combinations could cure uh, almost any cancer cell we threw it at. So it took a few years to convince people that this was worth trying, you know, because you say we're going to treat cancer by ignoring the cancer cell. Uh, there was a little bit of skepticism about whether that might work or not. Uh, but a company called Metarex that had mice that had had their immunoglobulin genes eliminated and replaced with humans, uh, so they could make fully human antibodies just by immunizing these mice. But we teamed up with them, um, made an antibody called, it was named by the Food and Drug Administration, Ipilumumab, which they began to develop in phase one, and then bristol myers Squibb teamed up with them to co-develop it, and then later ended up buying ipilimumab. But in these early uh, clinical trials, small clinical trials, their objective were to the responses in many tumor types, including melanoma, prostate, kidney. Um, Dr. Sharma showed in bladder cancer, there were com uh, uh, patho pathologic complete responders, also a variant in lung cancer and, and others. Um, but there were adverse events that began to be seen quickly. Typically, these were itises, colitis, hepatitis, pneumonitis, apophysitis. These are serious, but they're inflammatory reactions. They're generally manageable with systemic steroids. Those are not really, except for maybe the apophysitis, really autoimmune diseases, because they can be treated with systemic steroids, and then the patients can be weaned from them, and the, and the problems don't come back. Um, however, we know now that there have been hundreds of thousands of patients treated, uh, that there are patients, about 1% develop type 1 diabetes, and an even smaller fraction develop a T-cell mediated immune myocarditis, which is usually lethal. But again, these are uh, really, really rare adverse events. Um, and so, to just cut to the chase here, this is a phase three trial of ipilimumab in, in metastatic melanoma. Um, at the time, there was no standard of care, so the, there was a randomized trial of ipilimumab uh, versus a placebo control um, against, uh, uh, against metastatic melanoma. There was also an antibody plus peptide, but for now we'll ignore that. This is the placebo control, and as I said, the median survival was approximately 11 months. Uh, on this disease, but you can see the curve quickly comes down to essentially nothing. Uh, but the ipilimumab curve, as you can see, comes down, and it, the median survival has moved over by three to four months. So that would have been sufficient for FDA approval because no drug ever had done that of any type had ever done that in melanoma in a trial like this, a randomized trial. Uh, but that's not really the most striking thing. The most striking thing is between two and three years, there's an inflection point in the survival curve where it goes absolutely flat and stays there for the four and a half years of that, that, that overall trial, overall survival trial took. That tells us that nobody's dying after three years or so. Anyway, in 2011, it was approved by the Food and Drug Administration and, and uh, became the standard of care for treating that disease. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a, uh, follow-up in 5,000 patients for whom there was at least 10 years follow-up. And what you can see is the same thing holds in this sample of patients. You can see it flattens out at about three years. And at 10 years, 22% actually of the patients are still alive. And so for all intents and purposes, they can be considered cured of disease. And um, I know that they're not patients I know they get out there 10 years after therapy, they quit worrying about whether they're going to relapse. And so that's a significant accomplishment, but of course the question arises, why isn't it more? Why isn't it everybody? Why is it stuck on this 22%? Well, there's a, several uh, possibilities. One is mechanistic. Maybe there's no priming going on. As I told you, this works during T-cell priming. That's not happening when the drug's on board, it's not gonna have much effect. But the second one, of course, that's a lot more interesting is maybe there are more uh, checkpoints. And without belaboring it, about 2001, when the clinical data from CTLA-4 blockade were coming in, um, a group at the Dana-Farber discovered that another molecule called PD-1 was actually another checkpoint. Uh, I mean, it had two ligands, um, then one of which 
was on, could be induced on tumor cells, and this inhibits the function of T cells much later in the response. So it, just without going into all the details, um, it's different in two ways. One is that it's an induced resistance mechanism. The tumors upregulate PD-1, PD ligand 1 um, in response to gamma interferon made by T cells. Then that interacts with PD-1 on the T cell and turns them off. And so it's unlike uh, CTLA-4, which is hardwired. Um, but anyway, PD-1 antibodies quickly went into phase one trial. Uh, this just shows you some of the results of that trial. Melanoma, a decent objective response rate here. Uh, Non-small lung cell cancer. Uh, renal cancer, again, no responses in colorectal cancer carcinoma in this trial. However, uh, very shortly after, it was found that there was a subset of colorectal cancer patients with defects in DNA damage repair that have a high level of neoantigens, high level of mutations, therefore neoantigens, and they respond very well. And also no responders in castrate-resistant prostate cancer, and I'll show you in a little while why, why we think that is and how to get around it. Um, so where do we go from here? Well, obviously, if you've got two things that work and they've got different mechanisms, you think about combining them. And so we did some mouse work um, showing that, that, that PD-1 and CTLA-4 blockade uh, were at least additive. And so this is a, a fairly large uh, randomized trial of ipilimumab versus ipilimumab plus nivolumab, a PD-1 antibody developed by bristol myers squibb And you can see the combination has a response rate of about 60%. And now this has been approved also by the FDA now. PD-1 has been approved as a monotherapy, and this combination has been approved for treating metastatic melanoma. And the survival on this is now out to a little over three years, and it's still 60%. And so if that uh, you know, matures, we expect, that that may be close to 60% as well, although we don't know, and I'm just speculating on that. But, uh, you know, we expect it to be at least 20% and maybe even 60%. So we've gone then from a disease which was almost uniformly lethal in, in, in patients, of median of 50% of patients uh, within 11 months, to being able to treat, perhaps cure, uh, uh, maybe as much as 60% of patients with this disease. And so a, a lot of promise there and a lot of attention to it. So this is, and I think this is short a couple of kinds of cancer, but these are the indications for which these drugs have been approved by the FDA of the U.S. Uh, melanoma, adjuvant melanoma, pediatric melanoma, as I mentioned, anacetyl A4, two different PD-1 drugs, and then the combination have all been approved in melanoma. Non-small cell lung cancer, PD-1 drugs, renal cell cancer, no more Hodgkin's lymphoma, bladder cancer, head and neck cancer, Merkel cell. Um, and then really a landmark was because of the high response rate of patients with defects in DNA damage repair, probably as a result of all the new neoantigens that are produced by that, any patient with any type of cancer who has defects, any defect in DNA damage repair, can be treated with antibodies, at least the, um, the, this, this pembrolizumab antibody to PD-1. So it's really a hallmark. That's the first time that's ever occurred that treatment of a class of patients based on a single genetic lesion was a feature, uh, was approved. Also gastric cancer and hepatocellular carcinoma have been approved. And in case there's any lack of clarity, that means that any doctor prescribed prescribe these drugs for those indications. And in the U.S., more importantly, insurance uh, pays for it. So where do we go from there? Well, obviously there's a lot of promise there, uh, but there are critical issues that we need to really pay attention to for further development. We really need to know the per how, how the, these drugs work, what the mechanisms, um, both the cellular and molecular mechanisms are involved in the anti-tumor effect. We know a lot from mouse studies, but we really need to study what's going on in humans as well. And we also need to know the details of impacts of radiation giving in different ways. Are, are chemotherapies, are the, are the genetically targeted drugs? We need to know the details of what they do to the immune system so that we can develop new rational therapies uh, based on rational combinations that will, you know, give you two drugs that are likely to work with each other and have synergy and not either duplicate each other's activities or cancel each other out. 
Right now, there are over 1,300 trials of PD-1 combinations, and I will tell you very few of those are based on any real mechanistic understanding of the partners, and they're wasting a lot of patience and wasting a lot of time and money. Um, so actually, one of the things that we've done uh, at MD Anderson is Dr. Sharma and I formed a thing called the Immunotherapy Platform, where we're involved now in a, over 100 trials of patients where we get blood and tissues and try to look at these by all the techniques that we could bring to bear and understand their mechanisms. And of course, it'd be useful to target new molecules to improve efficacy and identify predictive or pro prognostic or even pharmacodynamic markers that could tell you what a drug has hit its targets. And we have some examples of those, but I'm not gonna have a chance to talk about those today. So what I'd like to do is just show you two ways that, two things that are important about, or two reasons why tumors may not respond to, to this type of immunotherapy. One of them is that it's become apparent um, that different kinds of tumors have different mutational loads. And what we know from the immunotherapies, uh, at least checkpoint blockade, is that the patients, there's, there's an association of response with higher mutational loads, again, because those are associated with the numbers of neoantigens that can be detected by the immune system. So the highest mutational loads are in these kinds of cancers shown in the, in the right here. Melanoma caused by uh, uh, UV-induced mutations, and then lung, stomach, esophageal cancer, uh, colorectal, and bladder, which fail to reach the level of significance. You can see the blue line is the ipilimumab curve. There were, again, were responders, but just not enough to reach a level of significance. So it has a very lo low level of mutations, as I told you. So um, Dr. Sharma was uh, the PI of a trial where we um, decided to look at this by, by getting tumor tissue um, in patients by resection of the cancer, uh, did exosome and RNA sequencing um, uh, to identify potential neoantigens. We didn't try to predict them, we just looked for expressed uh, RNAs, uh, RNAs. And then the patients went on ipilimumab therapy, and after th initiation of therapy, we looked for responses, and then we looked for T cell responses by, in the, by T cells from the blood uh, of the patients. And what you can see here, this is prostate specific antigens. This is from a patient that was a responder. You can see um, he had T cells to prostate specific antigen, prostate specific membrane antigen, and prostatic acid phosphatase. These are three well-known shared antigens in prostate cancer uh, that people have been studying for years. So the, this patient did have antibodies, or had T cells specific for those. But excitingly, and this was a patient which had only about 20 expressed mutations that were even expressed at the level of RNA. He had two peptides, really doesn't matter what they are. Anyway, uh, that had single amino acid mutations that did generate T cell responses um, in those. So despite the fact that there's a very low number, you can have uh, successful responses. Now we don't know which of those responses is the important one yet, and we probably won't ever know, but it's just comforting to know that uh, it's, it's kind of a uh, lottery. You know, the more mutations you have, the more uh, likely you are to respond, but it's not necessary to have a lot of them to get some responses anyway, and they may work together. So another reason why tumors uh, may not respond is they may not be infiltrated by immune cells. Um, this is from a review that Dr. Shorman and I wrote a few years ago. Um, hot tumors are tumors that have a lot of infiltrates already. Melanoma is a pretty hot tumor. Um, kidney can be. Uh, and all you have to do if you've got a rich load of, of T cells in a tumor is identify or not, but anyway, just, just block the inhibitory molecules that are there, pathways that are there, and release the T cells. But there are other tumors like prostate, um, um, uh, glioblastoma, pancreatic cancer that are very cold tumors and have few, if any, T cells in them. And in order to get this form of therapy to work, you've got to get the T cells inside the cancer. And so uh, we've done that in, in, in many ways 
uh, oncolytic viruses is one, um, um, intracellular injection of anacetyl, intertumoral injection of anacetylic 4 antibodies is another. Uh, but anyway, I'll just show you uh, one of the things that, again, the, the, in a trial that uh, Dr. Sharma, this is a different Sharma, developed. But anyway, this just shows what the relative level of, of infiltrates of different kinds of cells. These are uh, uh, CD8 cells, uh, CD45 RO cells, and then granzyme B cells in pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, bladder cancer, then melanoma. And you can see in virtually all of those, there's much more going on in melanoma than the other, than the other cancers. So this was just in a survey of different kinds of cancer. Um, so what we decided to do, what, or what Pam did was design a trial uh, where patients were given CTLA-4 before they went to surgery, pre-surgical trial of hormone therapy plus ipilimumab in patients with localized disease that were going to surgery anyway. For, and then we got the prostatectomy and could look at what's going on in the tissues. And, and what uh, was found was that the pre-treatment the pre tumor was very cold. You could see very few infiltrates at all. But after treatment with CTLA-4, the robust CD4 infiltr infiltration of tumors, it could make prostate a hot, a hot tumor, just giving them the anti-CTLA-4 antibody. And I can tell you that, that PD-1 does not do that. And so this is a fundamental difference between those two antibodies, at least in the tumors that we've looked at. Um, when, when there is, a, we looked at RNA, um, the group looked at RNA expression. We saw it was induction of a lot of uh, RNAs associated with T cell um, presence, as you might imagine. But particularly interesting was that the uh, RNAs indicated PD-1, the ligand that inhibits through PD-1 binding, and VISTA, another inhibitory molecule that's known to be expressed on macrophages. Anyway, this shows the proteins there too. Here's PD-1 after CTLA-4 treatment. It's ligand PDL one and this new one, VISTA. And so if you look at the quantitation of these, very little PDL one on CD4, a lot on CD8 T cells, um, a lot on also on macrophages and a lot of the tumor cells themselves. So CDLA4 has driven the T cells in, but there's this inhibitory marker all over the place now. Uh, and then also, this shows that VISTA uh, is also induced on CD8 T cells, but mostly on, on uh, macrophages in the tumor. And so this led to the proposal then to use CDLA4 to drive T cells in in combination with PD-1 to take out the PD-L1, which leads to inhibition. And so again, Dr. Schwarber designed this, this trial of CTLA-4 plus PD-1 in prostate cancer. And um, this is early days, but there were three patients so far. This is the PSA level, uh, where after the first treatment, the PSA fell after the second, fell essentially undetectable and uh, with shrinkage of bone mats and everything else. And so. Uh, really good responses in patients that are given both of these. And so there's issues, of, some issues of toxicity, but this, this is being now uh, uh, looking at more numbers and going to refine the treatment schedule. So we think this offers promise. Again, these are preliminary doses at this time. So I think this shows you the kind of approach that you can use in understanding what's going on to get responses in, patients, in tumor types uh, that may not respond well. And just to close, I'll just show, uh, when we started this work, there were not that many surface markers known on T-cells. There was the T-cell receptor, and CD28, and then CTLA-4, and now there's all these guys here. There's dozens of molecules now, uh, many of which, these all actually, the ones that are labeled here, have all been shown to involve either positive regulation or no negative regulation of T-cells. So there's, there's a lot to do in working out good combinations to treat more cancer. And uh, what we can see now, it's already happening, and we've done most of these combinations here in mirroring models, but it's possible to use multiple checkpoints, uh, enhance innate immunity, oncolytic viruses, cryoablation even, or thermal ablation, uh, blocking other immunosuppressive factors such as um, IDO. Uh, it can be combined with conventional therapies, radiation, of course, and, and uh, genomically targeted therapies. And this, the opportunities emerging that 
uh, that you can not try to use chemotherapy, the targeted therapies, the radiation to kill every last tumor cell and run the risk of damaging the immune system at the same time, but just kill enough tumor cells to prime an immune response and let the immune response take out the rest of the tumor cells and give you the memory and, and the other benefits of immunotherapies. And so just to close, I think the excitement of this is that this is where we've been for the last 30 years or so in, in oncology is in the field, is uh, taking a lot of patients, treating them with a drug, doing a statistical analysis and see if we could move the median survival over a little bit. What we know now from ipilimumab is you can do that, but you could also get this tail on the survival curve. Again, in melanoma, the 10-year survival plus is about 22%. And the next curve is an aspirational one, uh, but based on the finding of ipilimumab plus um, uh, uh, nivolumab in melanoma, is we can, the goal now, we think, of cancer research should be not to just move the median over, but to get the survival, the tail of the survival curve, as high as we can get it, and as many different kinds of cancer as we can get it. And the excitement is because we know it can be done, uh, again, to at least 60% in melanoma, and we know the basic rules now. And so the question is just working hard enough and being rational enough and, and, and to really do things in the right way to make the things work for the patients and as, as many different patients as we can and many different cancer types as we can. And I think there's a lot of optimism for rapid progress in the, in the next few years. And, you know, thank you for your patience. I hope I didn't go over time. Too much.